All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, as we covered here last week, Biden did come through in his big DNC speech, delivering a lengthy, forceful oratory with few errors. Look, guys. We're talking about the lowest of low bars here this year all around. On substance, of course, the speech mirroring the entire DNC was virtually devoid of anything besides the vaguest of promises. But there was one line in particular that kind of stuck with me. Take a listen. I've always believed you can define America in one word. Possibilities. The defining feature of America, everything is possible. That in America, everyone, and I mean everyone, should be given an opportunity to go as far as their dreams and God-given ability will take them. I know, I know. It's a fairly standard issue line. But actually, the fact that that line is so un uncontroversial, so embedded in the national neoliberal psyche, is something that we should pause and reflect on. In fact, in this one little pablum verse is all the evidence that you need of how the plutocrats have fully co-opted the Democratic Party. And they already own the Republican Party, of course. But allow me to explain what I mean here. Everyone should be given the opportunity to go as far as their God-given ability will take them. This is, in fact, the language of the meritocracy, the language of the overclass. These are the banal platitudes that justify billions for some and poverty for others. Republicans call people makers and takers. Democrats call them those with or without God-given abilities. It's the polar opposite of the principle of solidarity and a program of economic rights. The opportunity to live up to your God-given abilities means if you end up in the street after Steve Mnuchin foreclosed on your home, it's your own damn fault. That moment reminded me that buried under all the heartwarming tales of Joe Biden overcoming a stutter and John Lewis and the civil rights era and all the decency porn of the proceedings, as Matt Stoller memorably put it, was a quiet class war. It was there when unions were barely mentioned. It was there when policy was dropped in favor of vague cliches from a bunch of people who want to send your kids into the next war. And when leftists were rendered invisible at the convention and in the coverage. This class war was everywhere at the DNC, and it's everywhere right now in our nation. After all, there is an unprecedented transfer of wealth happening before our very eyes. Billions upon billions flowing from local communities and workers and small businesses to the plutocrat class. Elon Musk, Dan Gilbert, and Bezos added about $35 billion to their wealth last week alone. The S&P 500 hit an all-time high on the strength of basically three mega companies, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft. Meanwhile, 40% of small businesses are facing permanent closure, which will devastate their owners, their workers, and of course the communities, which will have even more of their wealth sucked out to a few mega cities. This isn't an accident, and it's not inevitable. And if you aren't actively fighting it, then you're on the other side of it fighting alongside the wealthy. If you have power and you're not railing against it, then you may as well be personally stroking a check to Bezos himself while ripping the floor out from the working class once again. That's the thing about the plutocrats' class war. The first rule is there is no class war. They've already set the rules. They already run the institutions. By just allowing their cronies in government and the media and the rules they've rigged to do their thing, they win. If Democrats win, they win. If Republicans win, they win. Now, Rahm Emanuel has been fighting for the plutocrats in this class war for decades now, and he is poised to continue that role in a prospective Biden administration. Ron kind of has a Forrest Gump-like way of being at the scene of every Democratic crime over the past 30 years. He was chief fundraiser for Bill Clinton, providing the funds for him to ride out the storm of Jennifer Flowers' accusations. Then he was deeply involved in NAFTA. He killed Howard Dean's 50-state strategy and aggressively recruited right-wing candidates as head of the DCCC. He was a primary player in ruining the Obama administration, helping to put the nail in the coffin of a public option to Obamacare, and reportedly delighted in the murderous drone attacks that were favored by Obama. His tenure as Chicago mayor was absolutely disastrous, marked by conflict with teachers' unions and an outrageous cover-up after police killed a 17-year-old named Laquan McDonald. So what better person to bring in as a key political advisor than someone who is as complicit as anyone in the current disaster we are all living through? One thing I do like about Rom, though, is that he's a little more forthright in his class warfare. He recently penned a piece in the Wall Street Journal that is the stuff of nightmares, in my opinion, laying out in explicit terms the plan to create, quote, Biden Republicans, the mirror image of the Reagan Democrats. So what that means is he's talking about intentionally swapping out more working class voters for upscale white collar moderates. Here he is explaining on CNBC. If with a concentration, A, not only through the election, but governing, you can take Biden Republicans who do not like the anti-science, do not like 
the anti-diversity, the hostility to other that comes out of the Republican Party culturally move them into a comfort zone where they're more self-identified with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. That's what the Reagan Democrats did starting in 80, and it evolved over time. But you have to have a gut, not only an electoral strategy, but as well as a, uh, a governing strategy to see that as an opportunity. And my view is you don't want this to be a transactional election. You want this to be the opportunity of a transformational right. election. In other words, the goal of the Biden administration should not be any sort of working class restoration project, but rather to studiously avoid doing anything that would send the John Kasich wing skittering from the party. Now, Rahm is the type smart enough to realize that now is his chance to once and for all tip the scales in the Dem base away from the working class and towards the affluent suburbanite and their regressive economic instincts. He frames it as a political strategy, but it's not really. If you really wanted to blow the doors off on this election, you'd offer the American people an actual economic agenda. As my friend Sagar here says, never has the public been hungrier for a true economic populist campaign. This isn't electoral strategy, it's class warfare. Now, I think in spite of their economic abdication, Democrats may well win this fall for all the reasons that will surely be on full display this week at the RNC. But let's be clear, the election isn't really the point for these people, not for Rom or for Larry Summers, who is advising Biden on personnel, or for Obama, who'll do everything in his power to keep the party from moving left on economics and making him look bad. Many observers noted the virtual absence of any class language from last week's DNC, but make no mistake, an absence of class rhetoric is the strongest possible indicator that class war is in fact being waged. We'll of course be all over covering the RNC this week, and the plutocrats are waging war from that side of the aisle as well. But the Democrats and their fetishized Biden Republicans have now fully joined the fight, and they aren't even bothering anymore to pretend otherwise. I thought that clip with Rom yeah. and the op-ed that he wrote in the Wall Street Journal, so, not even telling. I mean, it just explicitly lays out, like the Reagan Democrats who were blue collar, work, white working class. This isn't, we're gonna win them back. Mm -hmm. This is, the GOP can have them because we're gonna steal the John Kasich types. We're gonna steal the Nicole Wallace types. We're going to double down on this upscale democratic coalition. And by the way, when we get into power, we're going to also govern to pander to these yes. same groups to keep them in the coalition. I think it's, I mean, actually, I think it's brilliant. He's right. I mean, I wouldn't want it if I was a progressive Democrat, but he's not wrong. You can win that way. I think he's right. He's like, yeah, you know, most of these upper middle class white liberal or upper middle class white families are culturally liberal, you know, in an amorphous way. They're not yeah. economically liberal. They're socially liberal. And Biden, once again, they keep saying this and nobody in the press seems to uh, find it. The biggest thing that came out of his weekend interview on ABC, according to the press, was like, he says he might run for a second term. No, 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 no. He made once again the pledge alongside Kamala Harris, I will never raise taxes on anybody making over $400,000 a year, which to my knowledge has not once been presented to him Mr. B uh, Vice President, why are you revising that figure upward from 250,000 that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton announced whenever they were in office? Wasn't there a Medicare thing on this as well, where he was like, I won't raise the age above 65. It's like even Hillary said 60. He, was, he, was, yeah. he said he's going to lower the, the Medicare age by five years. That's right. Hillary yeah. was ready to lower for 10 years. years. Yeah, so it's like, it's Most like, progressive administration ever. Wow. Like, right. So you're revising up Social Security entitlement age. Um, um, even though you're technically trying to change it, you're revising up your upward most tax bracket. You have one of your most senior policy advisors saying essentially that you should be fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Um, that's actually a decent coalition for the Democrats. I mean, we're seeing that, right? If they can get all these white suburban voters and they, they keep them forever, then that can happen. And now what I've said is what the right the great tragedy of politics is the right wants to be like, no, 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 no. those suburban we want voters them. are ours. Yeah. And well, meanwhile, working class voters are like, please help us see us. <laughs> There's yeah. this, this tweet that you probably see and it's yeah. like, working class, please help us. Republicans just say no. The yeah. Democrats say like, no, hashtag BLM, pride flag, heart <laughs> emoji. From Isaiah, great viewer. <laughs> Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing tweet. And it just like captures absolutely everything. I do want to yeah. dissent a little yeah. bit on the electoral strategy though. Mm. I do think it'll be enough for this fall. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. But ultimately, if you really wanted to win, you would offer something real. You could win those same, like, 
cultural liberal yes. voters this time around. They're sick of Trump. They're not going in that direction. They're going your way anyway. And as we both know, like that culturally liberal, fiscal conservative ideological group is the most over, overrepresented so in Washington. Yeah, right. They'll go yeah. anyway. Yeah. And they are the smallest actual faction in American politics. Mm -hmm. So it isn't that rich a vein ultimately to mine. Whereas actually, what is always overlooked in this country is the fact that there are so many more non-college educated voters who are non-voters, right? So you look at the numbers on, on health care for all, you look at the numbers on UBI, you look at the numbers on stimulus unemployment benefits during this time, they are overwhelmingly popular. So yes, could Biden potentially eke out a victory with the Rahm Emanuel Biden Republican coalition? Yeah, because Trump is doing his damn just to make sure he loses, mm -hmm. right? But I don't actually think it is the best ultimate electoral strategy. And I don't think that this is what they really care about. What they really care about is the fact that that coalition is very comfortable for them. Rahm's a Wall Street guy. He's working. That's right. He's working on Wall Street. These are his people. This is who he's ultimately catering to. He dresses it up, and this is what they always do. And well, this is what you have to do to win. Mm -hmm. When actually they'd be in a much stronger position if they tracked. I think you're way. right. Which is that this isn't the only way to win, but this is how you can win and make sure Rahm stays king of the party forever, there you go. and you make That's sure that one. Obama wins Trump. That's what they care about the most. Yep. I mean, I covered this. All all Obama really cares about is ensuring his legacy. They want to be able to win and keep that. So, okay, they found a way to do it, but you're right, full of risk, a lot of risk behind it, not necessarily a long-term coalition. Perhaps a smart one is if their only real goal is to stay in power, which is what it is. Indeed. Yeah. All right, coming up on Rising, you might have heard the RNC starts tonight. <laughs> Senior political reporter at Vox, Jane Coaston, is going to weigh in on what to expect when Rising returns.